Hi, and thank you for tuning in to You and Your Money. I'm your host, Brian Hirsch, and in tonight's program, we are focusing on estate planning, offering insights and guidance to help you make informed decisions. As this is National Wills Week, I'm pleased that Harry Joffe, Head of Legal Services at Discovery Life, is joining us this evening. It's an excellent opportunity to create or update your will with free drafting services from legal professionals. If you have assets abroad, it's crucial to structure your will carefully when it comes to will. There are three possibilities. You either do not have a will, or your will is simple and may not have been updated, or your will is more complicated. Harry, good evening to you. Thanks, Harry, Mark. I mentioned the first part, which is not only unique to South Africa, that people don't have a will. But I think, you know, with National Wills Week, obviously, who will draft wills? And it is, is it mainly for simple wills? And then what is the, how would you identify the difference between a simple will and something more complicated? And obviously, there we're talking about having children, minor children. But over to you, Harry. Yeah, so let's look at your last question first, Brian. I mean, a simple will is basically where, you know, normally you've got a husband and wife and they leave everything to each other, or spouses leave everything to each other. That's a straightforward, simple will. We call it a mirror will in the industry. You know, it's basically the same, just different, different testators. But you're right. I mean, a more complicated will starts becoming, I would say, under three conditions. Number one, your assets might be more complicated. So you might have crypto, you might have uh, exotic assets like horses, someone like you, Brian, might have artwork, old Man United shirts, but those aren't got no value. We're talking about assets of, of real value. So you might have artwork, crypto, you might have old books, you, you know, complicated assets. Crypto is particularly Paintings, complex. Paintings, you said. Uh, Persians, antiques. Exactly. But uh, crypto, we find, is particularly complicated because, you know, first of all, you've got to make sure your family know that the crypto exists. Secondly, you've got to find a way to get the password to the family. And, of course, you're not going to put that in the will. You have to find a safe way to get the password to them. So the minute you've got more complicated assets, could be shares in a company, it could be your personal business, that makes the world more complicated, number one. Number two, as you said in your intro, Brian, the minute you've got offshore assets, that makes it a lot more complex because then you've got to make the call, which we always discuss, me, you, and Gordon, you know, do you need a separate will for the offshore assets? Does your local will do the job? So it depends what kind of offshore assets you've got. If you've got fixed property or if you've got shares abroad, then you'd want a separate foreign will. And then the third thing, of course, it depends on your life. If you've got a complicated life, then you're going to need a more complex will. So, for example, you might have a second marriage, you might have children from both marriages, you might have a common law relationship, you might have complicated bequests you want to do to charities, to trusts, you might have minor children that you want to look after through various trusts, you know, then the world becomes more complicated. But if you're just straightforward, spouses to each other or just to one party, then it's a, a very simple will. But Harry, even if you talk about simple will, spouses to each other, if there's simultaneous death, exactly, then you've got, to, you've got to, in that will, state where are these assets going to. Correct. I mean, you could have grandchildren there coming through the back door. You could have minor children inheriting that way. You know, it's the same thing with your policy. So, spouses leave their policies to each other. So, a husband takes a life policy, makes his wife the beneficiary. What happens if they die together? Can you nominate a backup beneficiary? Some insurance companies allow it, some don't. But again, you might want a backup beneficiary on the policy. You might want a backup beneficiary in your will. And a backup executor, I mean, your executor, if it's an individual, could also die with you. We Harry, you know, I learn every day. I've never heard in all the years, and, and I'm nearly next January 60 years in the industry, but I've never heard of a backup beneficiary in a life policy. Yeah, so as I say, some of the insurers allow it, where you can nominate, say you nominate your spouse as a beneficiary, there's a backup which says if my spouse dies, say within seven days of me, then this individual will be the beneficiary. Because aut because automatically, if it's if it's if the the the, po the beneficiary nom nomination will f will will override anything you put in the will. Yes, that's why it must be a backup beneficiary on the insurer's system. It's no good putting something in the will. When you say some companies, does Discovery allow that? We are not yet. We are in the process of allowing it. And the old traditional insurers, the old mutuals, the so Sunlam does. Sunlam does. Um, I know for a fact. Now, um, why it gets a little bit tricky, why we haven't allowed it yet, and why I say we're in the process of allowing it, is the system has to be specially set up to have a backup beneficiary. Because, you know, it's no good sending a letter to your insurance company to say, if we die together, I want X to be the beneficiary. Because it's not in their system, 
they'll pay the wrong person, they'll pay their state still. So you have to have a system change to uh, allocate a backup beneficiary so the system can read who to pay if they both die. But it's a very important principle. We saw it during COVID, you know, whole families die together. Now there's no beneficiary, so it's got to pay into a deceased estate, and then everyone's got to wait to get the money out. Harry, so let, let's go back. National Wills Week. Yes. Where would someone find someone find who is doing that? And are they only going to be concentrating on simple wills? Yeah, so actually, Brian, before I came in, I did a little bit of research. I take my job on the show very seriously. So I went onto the Law Society website. And if any of our viewers go onto that Law Society website, it's actually very well set up. They've got all the provinces, and there's a list of law firms in each province which is, or who are involved in Wills Week, and you can contact them and they'll do a free will. So where would you find that on the website? Where would you go? Just to the Law Society website. Just uh, Google Law Society of South Africa. Okay. It will all be on there. And they'll lead you to... To the wills are? Because there's not all the provinces and all the law firms in each province, and it's a simple will. Uh, I think they'll explain to you what a more complicated okay. will will mean. Okay. Harry, be because we're doing National Wills Week, I want to hone in a little bit more than we normally do on wills. But over the years, we've always discussed about the importance of the difference between intervivus trust and a testamentary trust. Intervivus is a trust that you form during your lifetime. You are in control. Testamentary trust is formed by the executor on your death. But we had, we had your good friend, Mervyn, on the, on the program with us a long time ago. Mm. And Mervyn said, no, he's not for that. He thinks you should be setting up a, a bottom draw trust. What is your view on that, this, this story about having a bottom draw trust? And, uh, and, and I've examined it, you know. The costs are quite high. But I think you... I think talking local or offshore, Brian? No, local. Uh, I, I think you've mentioned that you guys will set up an off, a bottom draw trust. So that's how I was asking if it's local offshore. So there's two distinct uh, versions. Generally, the bottom draw trust applies offshore because offshore trusts are very expensive. Most normal people can't afford them. So what you do is you take what we call this bottom draw trust, which is just set up and it exists, but it normally only sits in the bottom draw until it gets assets. And there you'll pay between $250 to $450 a year. For, key, for just having that, the right to that dormant trust. Yes, and that dormant trust will be a beneficiary in all of life insurance policies abroad. Now, locally, uh, bottom draw trust is a normal trust. There's no difference because it's set up, it exists, it's up and running, and it just sits there. We normally mean it's an empty trust where it's got no assets in it. Now, the problem, as you've correctly identified, is with all our money laundering and anti-gray listing legislation, it's still an expensive vehicle to run because you need to have a professional trustee you need to do all your reporting to the master and to SARS annually. You'll need to normally have an accountant to do the tax returns and do the financials. Even though there's no tax return and no assets Every in the trust? Every trust has to do a tax return. That's where we're different now. After the grey listing and all the anti-money laundering legislation, every trust, even if it's empty, has to do an annual tax return to SARS, has to submit financials to SARS, even if it's empty, it has to do all of that. So that's why you're correctly saying it can become an expensive vehicle. So... I mean, uh, to me, there's, two, there's only two issues. It's, do you do inter vivos or testamentary? If you can afford an inter vivos, great. But otherwise, a testamentary is better. I wouldn't do a bottom drawer trust which is empty in South Africa. To me, it's still expensive, and I'm not sure if it's necessary, where you can do a testamentary trust. I was talking to an executor the other day, and he said he gets a testamentary trust through very quickly. Because what he does, when he lodges the application to become the executor, he at the same time lodges a trust uh, application and he gets both back at the same time. So it cuts out quite a lot of time. So I would say if you can afford it to be was fine. If you can't, I would go the testamentary route. Then Harry, let's talk about inheritance, offshore inheritance. Because there were inheritance before 1998 and then after 2022. W what is the difference? Right, so pre-March 1998, if you had an offshore inheritance, the money had to come back. Any inheritance after, I think it's the 17th of March 1998, I can't remember the exact date, but I think it's the 17th. Any inheritance after that date could stay abroad, you just had to report to Saab. So you had to notify Saab and just get their formal uh, permission to keep the assets abroad. From February 2022, that last leg is gone, so now any inheritance after February 2022 can stay abroad and you don't even need to get Saab's permission to keep it there anymore. So what are you saying? People who inherited money early 2000s, all they had to do was inform SARS. Saab, that, yeah. And that was when the amnesties came in. There was the amnesty 2002, 2003, yes. 2009, 10, 2016, 17, something. So all you had to do, and then you could keep the assets offshore. Yes. 
And how do those assets now form part of the person living in South Africa in terms of his state duty? So they're full assets like anything, because remember we pay estate duty and worldwide assets and your worldwide estate. So it makes a difference where in the world it sits. The only difference it makes, if it sits in a country like the UK, where they also have estate duties, they have a death duty or a site of tax, you might pay duties there first, and that will be a credit. You might not end up paying duty here. But in principle, every asset worldwide is dutiable in South Africa if you're a South African resident. And if it's, in, and if it's left to you in your own name, if it's in a trust? So then it depends if you've got the loan account or if it's your asset to start, but if it's an inheritance that was left on your behalf to a trust, then it would stay out of your state unless you took it out of the trust. So anyone receiving money now, because we've got a lot of people, their families live overseas. I know we've had a lot of people going the other way, where many South Africans have left. But there are a lot of people from all over the world who've got families, they're going to inherit properties, they're going to inherit pensions. That now forms part of the South African estate. Well, I mean, it always has, Brian. Nothing's changed. Of course, we've discussed this before. The, I think it's a 4M exemption. There's a specific exemption in the State Duty Act if you're a South African and you inherit assets from a non-resident, remember there's that, that exemption and you weren't always South African. So if you come to live here and you weren't born here and you inherit offshore assets from a non-South African, that might be exempt. But in principle, if you're South African, you're born and bred here, your assets that you inherit are, are estate dutable. Remember you had that interesting case of that individual who was born in Egypt and came to live in South Africa and inherited assets from the UK and those assets they inherited in the UK were not estate dutable here. But that's the exemption generally. Most South Africans that are born here, all the assets they inherit are Okay, so that's South Africans, but people who weren't, bo weren't born here they and have settled here in recent years, over correct. the last 30, 40 years. My wife's been here. It's actually her birthday today. So, darling, happy birthday to you. Love you. Nearly married 54 years, yeah? 54 years. Well, um, yeah. I and love a push shirt as a gift. Yeah, um, okay. And after Saturday's performance, <laughs> definitely not. Uh, Harry, but so now... If, if someone, if my wife did inherit money, although her parents have gone a long time ago, that would not be dutiable. If it was from a non-South African yes. resident and offshore, then it might not be dutiable. Yeah. So that's an, a very tricky exemption. Yeah, viewers should look okay. at Okay. Well, Harry, we're going to take a break. Stay tuned, and we'll return shortly.